So today I'm uh, it's thankful to, to be here to present to you a little bit of uh, what uh, I do and the, the ideas that uh, I have. Um, I was trained originally as an engineer uh, and then I uh, wasn't a very good engineer and then I went into biology. In the, um, in the last 50 years, a lot of things have developed um, in engineering that has inspired a lot of things, enabled a lot of things that we can do in biology, um, understanding nature, peering uh, with microscopes, um, you know, we're developing electronics, communication, data processing to actually have a very good insight into biological systems. And that has really advanced our understanding of who we are and uh, from all the, from the molecular scale all the way to the population level. But increasingly with this understanding, there is a loop where we can now, with our understanding in biological systems, uh, get inspired to improve in the ways we do engineering and how we can see how evolution has done its experiments for us and then learn and gain insights and and this is an area uh, called, you know, people call it bioinspiration and biomimetics. And it's something that I've been uh, very interested in to marry the two between engineering and biology. Some of you who are young enough may know what these are. These are Pokemon characters. That's uh, amazing little uh, uh, creative cartoons created by Nintendo. Um, but in nature, they also have their own set of Pokemon characters. And these are tree hopper insects that have developed or evolved these ornaments uh, that they use as camouflage. So in natural systems, you just have, you have as many kind of diverse things that we can imagine uh, in, in, uh, in ourselves. A classic example of how biological systems inspire uh, the technology, you probably know Velcro and the classic story of how a Swiss engineer was walking through the fields and then he found these birds that were trapped by his, uh, on the, do the fur of his dog as well as on himself. But taking the step fur further to understand how these things work, it eventually led to the development of Velcro. And this is another example from Japan where the beak of the kingfisher has inspired the shape of the bullet train so that it produces less noise, um, uh, it uses less elect electricity, and allows the train to move faster. And of course, the kingfisher allows us, uh, it's able to do this so that it can uh, you know, catch a fish without disturbing the water before it you know, actually contacts the fish so that uh, the, the fish doesn't get an early warning system. And of course, this is one other example of how sharks, uh, a guy was looking for why, why does sharks not have uh, uh, things growing on its uh, skin. And so by looking at the molecular design or the, the nanoscale, uh, the design of the material that the shark skin has, they develop materials that uh, prevent anti-fouling. So this is also being applied in uh, looking at uh, antibacterial kind of materials that you can use uh, in hospitals. This is an example. You might know uh, about these, these sea monkeys or water bears. These are things that we play as a kid where you can, you know, they are all dried up, but when you add water, they just come back to life. And the, by, you know, taking a step further, someone went in on to, to look at how these things actually preserve its proteins and its DNA and macromolecules. And that has led to the development of different matrices that allow us to preserve DNA and proteins in, in cells without having to use refrigeration, which actually has a big uh, impact on our, our use of energy. So Singapore is situated in one of the most diverse ecosystems on the planet. You see there's, there's a lot of shipping here, but even despite so, our marine biology ecosystem is actually very diverse. Okay, so what we don't have in terms of biomass or, or land area, we actually have make up for it in terms of bi biodiversity. We have a lot of uh, information that's out there in our environment. So if you have not been to this, this is a new museum. I, I love it. I'm, I'm not associated with it, but it's a wonderful natural history museum. It's our first natural history museum in Singapore. There we have uh, a set of dinosaurs imported from the US. It's not from Singapore, but of course, these are my three children. Um, they love uh, going to see the dinosaurs. There's a lot of diverse biodiversity uh, that has been captured over the years in Singapore's uh, history that's uh, on display there. While the dinosaurs are great, what struck me was this exhibit. So about a year ago, 2015, a sperm whale carcass was found um, off Jurong Island. And this poor individual was the result of an accident with probably a propeller of, of a shipping uh, tank. And it washed upon shore, but the people from Natural History Museum were very quick in which they were able to process this and then put this into the Natural History Museum for us, for us to look at. And so there on the vertebrae, you can see this one that's uh, lit up. That's the one where the, probably, the, the missing vertebrae is probably where the propeller hit. But for me, you know, besides, you know, this is the first sperm whale that's found in our waters. What's amazing was uh, when you look at what's inside the stomach, what they actually found was this collection of squid beads that were found inside the stomach. So the sperm whale's uh, natural, uh, one of the, what he eats is uh, a squid. And we find these, you know, 
a lot of these squid bits that they can't digest. So it accumulates over time and then they regurgitate it over a period of time. But contrast to it was what you also find in the, in the stomach was also these plastic packaging and cups that you found. And if you look at the packaging, you can kind of figure out where it went. It was in Indonesia and then based on where these uh, foods were from. But it was just a striking contrast of how materials that we make don't have to be plastic. They can actually be very durable. Uh, and nature has kind of given us an evidence of this, that these are things that are tough, but they're also made with um, organic materials that we find uh, everywhere. So just to show that this is just a strong, this is another poor individual that met had untimely death with, uh, with, another, with a squid, uh, and using its beak, the squid can actually be, uh, be very strong. It's uh, almost as strong as uh, Kevlar. If you want to delve into the problem a bit more, what is it, what's special about the squid beak? So if you think about it, the, one of the things that squids eat are these crustaceans. They're very hard shell, okay, and you need to break it, so the beak is very tough. But if you have something like a knife, and you don't have a handle, or you're, you're touching something that your mouth, which is kind of like jello, that, that's an interface problem. Something that's very hard, you can apply a lot of force, but how do you not hurt yourself? How do you not cut yourself if it's a uniform thing? And so it has able to solve this, apply, you know, solve this problem in which it designs its beak so that it allows you to apply a lot of force but not yet uh, hurt its own uh, tissue. And so the way it does this is the beak has a gradient okay, of stiffness. So at the tip where it actually impacts onto the, the, the crustacean, uh, it's very stiff and then over the course of the beak, Okay, uh, there's a graduation in the in uh, into stiffness. So this allows it to apply a large force but not hurt itself. So this is amazing. And what's interesting is that this whole material is made of the same components. It's how it's processed that allows it to give this behavior. A man-made objects, if we have two things that we want to put together with different properties, we usually just glue it together or screw it together, but the interface is where the weakness is. So when, when I entered this problem, this, you know, we knew this, uh, our collaborators knew this, but at the time, you know, um, you know, advances in DNA sequencing and DNA synthesis, there's a lot to study biology at an unprecedented level. And so when we started this project, uh, we applied you know, advances in DNA sequencing that was used for healthcare, or proteomics, which is the study of proteins, as well as marrying the area of material science. We were able to gain an insight at the molecular level how this thing is made, how is it processed, how is it being made in the ocean, uh, in a green environment, in water, uh, and, that, and there's no, no top-down uh, processing. It's all self-assembly. Things just make, and they, they grow over the period of time, and they develop this, uh, uh, this amazing material. Not only the, is the beak an amazing material, something that you might not know, squids also have this other appendage. Uh, it's in arms, but inside its arms, they have these teeth that you can see there. It's pretty scary looking. Uh, this is from the Humboldt squid. So along its teeth, they have these suckers, and inside each sucker is a teeth, and this teeth is used for it, to, uh, is used by it to grab its prey. So uh, some of this work has been published, and so for different kinds of squids, you have different ring structures, okay? And what's amazing about this material is that it's very tough, but yet, uh, and, the, and for a long time, people thought that it was just the same material they used the beak uh, to make. This is a giant squid, and it's just captured our imaginations. It's also a pretty tough material, and this is an old picture from, uh, I think, the Smithsonian, where they took the skin of a whale, yeah, and they found this, uh, and this is the whale, the sperm whale, that, that eats squid, and you can see this, uh, the result of the fight that they had. And so, at that time, when they, they, they found these big squid marks, right, and they thought, well, oh, these are the giant squid, the kraken. If you scale up, the squid must be humongous. Of course, they didn't realize that these whales were small, probably, when they attacked, and then when they grew, the, 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 stretch, uh, the, the scars stretched. So the, the squids are not as big as they thought, but although they are uh, giant squids. So using that same process, we went in and we discovered, actually, this teeth doesn't look any, the materials that uh, make this teeth doesn't look anything like the beak. In fact, uh, we studied different species, and then we found that there's a whole new gene family that's specific to squid that's evolved to develop this uh, special material. And why is this material special? Well, it turns out that the reason why a lot of us, when we eat squid, we don't see it. When we cook it, it just melts away. Because this is an interesting polymer, which is thermoplastic. It means you heat it, you can remold it and refashion it into fibers and other kinds of uh, structures. But what's amazing is that when we looked at it, uh, comparing at the molecular level, it looks strikingly similar to spider silk. As you would know, spider silk is one of those special materials or super materials that people have worked on for centuries. At the molecular level, it, look, behave, it looks a lot like spider silk. So, but squids and spiders are not, the, not really related. They're separated by almost 500 million years of evolution. So evolution over time has came to the same solution for a different material. Okay? In, the, in this uh, case of the spider, it's using it to make a fiber. In this case, it's using it to make a bulk-strong material. 
But something that we can learn with similarities and differences between things that happen over long time scales, it's kind of a filter that evolution has done that we can now gain insight very quickly by comparing these little differences or little similarities and then start to think how can we tweak it for our purposes. So nature is primary building blocks. You know, we have biodiversity, but this is actually molecular biodiversity. And it's biodiversity using components that are very common, very freely abundant on, on Earth. So for us, the interest uh, doing genetics and doing engineering is how do we relate what's coded by the, at the DNA level to all the diverse stuff that you see uh, in natural systems. So now with, you know, uh, with modern biotechnology, uh, one question which uh, someone asked me is, are we going to run on a squid now? Are you going to go out and start uh, uh, catching every squid that you have? Well, no. So the nice things about understanding the principle of the design is that now we can also make this protein using other systems. Uh, for example, we can take the gene and put it into bacteria, and then we can produce a lot of the protein without having to go out and, and you know, go fishing, although that's fun. But what's also nice is that we can actually change the, the protein so that it, it conforms to what uh, the design that we want. So here we are working actively on using these proteins uh, to develop new uh, nanostructures uh, that we can use for photonic devices. Uh, my collaborators have shown that you can take this protein and 3D print it. Uh, you can also use it to grow um, nanoparticles for drug delivery and maybe eventually lo looking at uh, developing artificial joints out of this. So the future of production, one way to look at this, and, and many people are working on on this is that there, you know, we have access to this amazing biodiversity. We don't actually need to go and you know, to capture everything. We just need one individual or one plant or one bacteria. Once we have the ability to read the genetic code, then we can do a lot of uh, uh, get get a lot of insight that we can then put that into using fermentation purposes. Fermentation means a production, which are inherently green. You can imagine a future where you can produce this at home. This is using. Uh, water, sugar, and the bacteria, and they'll produce the material. You don't need a large factory with harsh solvents, high processing. Uh, this could be done uh, for manufacturing. And other things that people make besides materials are include chemicals, medicines, and then producing energy. And of course, uh, this is uh, published, I think, uh, a couple of weeks ago, a couple of months ago. Uh, food wastage in Singapore, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's quite high in a lot of modern societies. In fact, all the 800,000 tons that are, are produced almost 700,000 are, are not uh, thrown away. And so these kinds of ideas of how we can utilize food waste as a way to feed back into producing and feed the bacteria that produces uh, our materials and our, uh, our chemicals is a way to close the loop. And so I think that this is something that uh, we're looking at. But at the end of the day, when you produce something that you want to replace something that's existing, uh, it's all about the price and what price uh, decision be made. So just look at the question another way. You know, a lot of us are thinking about, you know, this is the movie, how can we colonize another planet? How can we bring in terraform? But I would say that we do have a planet that's pretty nice. Uh, there's a lot of things that we can do uh, with this planet. There's a lot of things we can learn. Uh, so I think we should still continue to work on things that we have at the present. But at the end of the day, uh, at what price? This is, the th I think, the something to allude for, that nature has given some insight that, hey, there's an answer. Uh, besides the plastic that we have, we have, um, materials that we can actually make if we apply ourselves. And I hope that one day uh, we have less of the one at the bottom and more materials that are made of the one uh, on top. So that's it. Thank you.